let me welcome uh, some some people that if you if you have not had the chance to hear from, this is going to be a, a great moment for you. So first, uh, we have uh, Dr. Penny Schwinn who is Tennessee's Commissioner of Education. And uh, she leads, um, uh, uh, she, well, I should mention, she's a former teacher as well, um, but also has served in, uh, in Texas, in Delaware, Sacramento. She has served in a whole variety of places and really has a great viewpoint on, on uh, what's happening now and where we need to be in the future of learning. Um, next, let's uh, welcome Carissa Moffitt-Miller. Dr. Miller is the uh, head of, she's the CEO of CCSSO, um, and that, of course, is the, the chief state school officer. So she is really helping oversee and, and, and provide strategy for all of the state leaders in how to think through this, this crazy moment. And uh, Chris is a, a great thought leader and a, and a good friend. And then uh, let me welcome uh, Angelica Infante Green, who is uh, the commissioner of my home state of Rhode Island. We're thrilled to have um, Commissioner Infante Green with us and sharing some of uh, what she's been doing. She has been a true innovator and really um, leading the future of, uh, of learning from, from Rhode Island. And then finally, last but not at all least, I wanna introduce Anna Edwards. Anna will be the moderator for our conversation. She is the chief advocacy um, officer for uh, uh, Whiteboard. She's actually the co-founder too of Whiteboard Advisors, which is a great group that helps think through strategy uh, for reinventing learning and thinking about doing things in, in exciting new ways. So uh, Anna, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Richard. And I think uh, Angelica is uh, in the process of logging back in, but um, we'll go ahead and get started given limited time today. Um, thank you uh, to our guests for being here and sharing a little bit about the experiences that you all have responding to COVID-19 uh, and technologies play a role. We'd love to just talk with kind of a quick state of uh, Chris, and maybe start with you as an organization that is supporting um, every state in the country right now and their education agencies. What's the current state of affairs um, generally as, as you see it? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, and it's good to be with all of you today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, we did a prep call last week and or maybe the week before that. And, you know, you just think about how much has changed on the ground even since then. Um, it, it is a day by day kind of uh, look at where we're at and then adjusting um, from from where we're at. Um, I know that both Penny and Angelica, when she joins us, will talk to you about the health and safety of teachers and kids and how they've approached um, making sure that that's the case. Um, but I wanna, I, I think I would be remiss if we went into talking about digital learning without laying the groundwork for some of the things that, that we're having to, to get into and, and some of the biggest barriers to getting to digital learning in the first place. Um, CCSSO has been very um, vocal and open about how much is needed uh, to bring back an emergency connectivity fund. We just signed on with 55 other organizations for $12 billion. Uh, for internet access for homes and devices for uh, kids. It's, it's so absolutely needed to even get to digital learning. Common Sense Media, um, I just wanna read this to you. Common Sense Media finds that 15 to 16 million public school students and as many as 400,000 educators may not have access to broadband or to devices. And so until we address that issue, um, we've gotta do that on a large scale. So that, that's our most pressing need on the ground right now. Um, but I do want to talk about a couple of things, and I'm, I'm going to leave Tennessee and Rhode Island to the experts to talk about that. So I'll talk about a different state, and that's Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi went into this eyes wide open, uh, what they called Mississippi Connects, and they spent $200 million um, to buy devices for every student uh, and, and teacher in the state. And they also connected that to the teacher training, which, um, you know, it, Richard was talking about that when we came on about the importance of the standards and the and what we know today about being uh, digital learning being a huge part of what goes on. And so um, that was a huge push. I also want to uh, point out that Virginia has had an online and virtual um, platform for a while. They used their CARES dollars to make sure that that was accessible to all of their districts to broadcast uh, classes uh, throughout the, the Commonwealth. And so those are just two examples of how we've used uh, economies of scale, which I'll come back to in, in a bit. But just want to say again, we have to address 
the the digital divide and and then also use what we know to be good about digital learning. Thanks. I think that was a really helpful way to, to start off with some context. Um, and hello, how are you, Commissioner? Good to see you in Helica. Um, you were just getting started with the state of the state, the perfect timing. Um, and we can go to the kind of state of affairs in Tennessee, and then we can um, go to Angelica. Sure. Sure. So, you know, Tennessee has taken a, a similar approach to a lot of states. Um, I think as soon as we had started hearing about the possibility of COVID coming, we had negotiated discounted rates for computers back in early February, late January. So we were able to negotiate um, $180 laptops um, and Wi-Fi connectivity for many of our students. Really, really pleased that the governor invested so much of his CRF dollars um, as well. So we, we have about a half a billion dollars of investment in into our public schools here. So that's allowed for um, virtually all of our students to have um, laptops or at least access to that. Um, 100,000 families who did not have access to Wi-Fi to have Wi-Fi. Now I say that, but there are places in Tennessee, our most rural communities where you know that doesn't help they actually need um they need something different we need to start building towers and more infrastructure so that high-speed internet becomes a public utility and not something that we are ban having this band-aid approach and that and that's for many rural communities across the country not just in tennessee but that's one of our biggest challenges right now we're able to problem solve for some of our urban areas or suburban areas and some of our more connected areas but it's a big state with a lot of gaps in service and that's been a challenge now, I think, you know, we certainly as administration have prioritized in-person learning. Um, that has been something that's been a bedrock um, from day one. Our first schools were back in session in July, um, and all but one of our districts has offered in-person learning in the state. Um, so there was no delay. There was no kind of let's see how it works out. It was school starts July 22nd for some of our districts, um, and we've had incredibly low case numbers and case counts since that point. But one of the things that we've also tried to do is say, you know, there are parents who are choosing to educate their kids at home, and that has got to be an honored choice. So how do we ensure that we allow for remote options in that space? And how do we provide professional development for our educators, principals, and families to be able to access high quality instruction now, but also moving forward into what we see as the next phase of education um, in real earnest? And so we put out free professional development for every single teacher in the state through Treveca. Um, we are on our second round of that. We have free professional development for every principal in the state through UT. Um, and that all started back in the spring. We're on a second round of that. And then the same thing, we have a partnership with Treveca for families and, and supports for them. Um, because we do want these best practices of digital learning to be able to be integrated meaningfully into the classroom. Um, and we're doing all of that through our hub, uh, Tennessee Best for All Central, which is essentially, I think, to Chris's earlier point, um, we, we developed a, a site that has, you know, a year long versions of, of um, instructional materials, content, videos, early learning, et cetera. I mean, that's those have all been, I think, incredibly important investments we've made for now and then moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, and Helica would love to hear about uh, the current state of affairs in Rhode Island. Sure. So we're currently in a two week pause as a state, um, meaning that almost everything else is on pause or on hold, except for schools, right? We've, we've been pretty clear that um, schools have to stay open. We went virtual in March, like everyone else said originally, and then we, the moment we went virtual, we were planning on how we were gonna come back. And that's how we have been working. So. You know, like everyone else, we saw the digital divide in many different ways in terms of technology, in terms of internet access, in terms of all those things. Um, but what we were committed was to getting a device in everyone's hand, and as well as not just a device, but also internet um, connectivity. And um, we used um, the governor's social capital. <laughs> we had her call every single one of the vendors from Verizon, from AT&T, and say, hey, we need you to give us this for free for our families, and that's what we have done. And um, so we have gotten to, every student has a device and every family has connectivity. Um, well, you know, it may not be, sometimes we, we have to replace the laptops because some of them are older, the Chromebooks, so now it's not just getting in their hands, it's now getting better. Um, also, how many people are online, um, how, you know, is it slower, all those kind of things that come into play with um, the digital world. But I think that, um, like Penny, we have also done a lot of things statewide that we were not be been able to do 
And um, we had a lot of um, digital training for parents, right? We realized very quickly that it wasn't just the devices, but then what do they do with the devices? So we partnered up with different organizations to have hotlines for parents in multiple languages, walk them through how to even get connected, how to have the, the conversation with their kids, how to put blockers and what to watch for. So we've done, we've done a lot of that. And we've done a lot of um, PD, over 100 plus professional development opportunities for our teachers free of charge that we've managed statewide, which has been pretty amazing. So that's where we are. And we're um, releasing SEL training right now for the entire state, for everyone in the entire state, meaning anyone that touches schools from superintendents, from APs, from teachers, from teachers assistants, from bus drivers, from um, people that work in the kitchen, everyone that works at schools will have this training that um, is free of charge and will have Yale credit attached to it so that we can all be in the same place. We've taken a very all state approach to the work that we're doing. Um, maybe we could stay there for just a minute um, as it relates to having gotten over a major hurdle with bridging the digital divide, but then um, the remaining challenges that might still exist. What What is your biggest focus right now going into the next year and, and what are likely to be some tough months ahead? Um, where, where do you think this state is going to be focused? Sure. So I, I can jump in for, for Tennessee. I think, you know, obviously we want to get through this year in a way that isn't just kind of hunkering down. I hear a lot of language around that, and that's not where we are in Tennessee. We are saying we still have a group of students. We have a strategic plan and a direction about accelerating achievement. It is going to be harder and it is going to look different, but it is our obligation and responsibility to every child in this state that they get a full year of a high quality public education and that we are continuing to push on those things that we knew were challenges before the pandemic. So you will see a continued, very aggressive emphasis on literacy in this state. Um, we've got some exciting things coming out later this month, um, but that is going to be a major priority. You will continue to see us focusing on educators um, and principals. We know that across the country, we have a high retirement population. We have a number of educators who are really tired. They've been working very hard for months and months um, I would love to see a federal relief package that is significantly more flexible. Um, I, I think a lot of folks don't know, but CRF did not allow for us to pay our first responders and our teachers bonuses, and that is unconscionable. So we've got to have space where we can start to use federal dollars to support educators and invest in things that will allow us to prevent shortages because we can get through this year and accelerate, but if folks are tired, they don't feel appreciated, um, and we don't have enough people because they've left the profession, I, I have nightmares about what that means for the future. And I think the other thing we're thinking about is how do we capitalize on the lessons learned for this year? We know that in the last pandemic 100 years ago, we got, we got nutrition and meals out of that. So school meals came out of that. So what is our big thing here? We know that I think technology is going to be kind of that one of those big things. I would also argue maybe school nurses um, would be another one. But um, we, are, we are thinking a lot about how do we leverage that so that it is not a one and done but we have sustainable funding for replacing devices as, as um, we've heard. How do we make sure that it is actually part of teacher and educator preparation programs where it is not something that is kind of after they be, go into the profession, they start to learn how to integrate it differently, but it becomes a real meaningful part of how they are instructed and the pedagogy around digital learning um, in their very earliest years um, in, in really becoming educators. So we're trying to think big picture um, in the next five years. I do believe as a state, that's our responsibility. It's it's as much to try to project one to five years out um, as it is to deal with the urgency of now. So that's a little bit of where our mindset is. Yeah, I'll add, and I, I agree with Penny. I think part of um, what we struggled with, the money that we did get, was kind of like the parameters. And the hard part about that is that they created all these parameters we're figuring all this out, right? <laughs> so you're limiting our ability to actually be creative you know, the parameters around things that the people that created these parameters don't know what we actually needed the money for. We didn't know what we needed the money and the flexibility for. So I think we need a lot of flexibility to be able to um, look at our individual needs. Every state is approaching this differently, has different needs. And um, I, I think that that is something that we need to look at in government period right now where we are, right? The, the name of the game is flexibility. For us in Rhode Island, I think one of the the, the most um, amazing thing that's happened is that, 
you know, you know how they say that old cliche, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, we really have capitalized on that because um, similar to Penny, we're thinking about this forced innovation that we're into right now, because that's what we're calling it. We would have never been here if this hadn't happened. It's really, how do we think about education period differently, right? We're talking about the inequities that exist, but we keep trying to apply the same type of, you know, algorithm and, and getting, you know, poor results. So how do we think out of the box? Like, what, what does it look like? What are kind of professional developments do our teachers need? How do we get them there? And what we've done is that we've done a lot of statewide. We have taken a very much a statewide approach into everything that we're doing, um, especially when you talk about districts that have certain advantages over others. That doesn't have to exist anymore. We've blurred those lines, and we need to capitalize on that. And we've been doing schooling the same way we've been doing it for 100 years. So how do we create the flexibility to really redesign and reimagine what education can be? That's where we are right now. Like this is, this is an exciting time, even though it's very stressful, very draining. Um, but we have the ability to create something new that actually benefits kids instead of kind of, you know, this, this Band-Aid approach that we've used to education. Um, so I, I think it's just an amazing time. And we have seen that our kids have, have helped us in Rhode Island redesign what education looks like. So we did a lot of that work this summer. And we saw a 500 point increase on their SAT just from attending this six week um, institute that we had. That's pretty amazing. Designed by kids for kids that actually has some tangible results and we had 100% attendance, right? So I think that if we start doing things differently, we're gonna see that shift. And I just wanna, I, I wanna piggyback off of something uh, both of the uh, leaders have said today, um, and th that this is really an equity issue. Richard was talking when we came on about how, you know, ISTE has been at the forefront of this, that we've had digital learning standards for a long time. But we've not had that for everybody. Um, and this is one of those opportunities where if I go back to that economies of scale where state leaders are stepping in and saying, look, we're going to use the existing funding. And, and, you know, Penny's right about CRF funding and CARES Act funding and, and the ways in which we could use those things um, to really leverage uh, an opportunity to to go out further and farther rather than just certain districts having uh, access to these things or certain teachers in districts to have access um, to the ways in which they deliver um, education and that it's not um, it's not one of those moments where we have to do it just to get through a pandemic, right? It's the, uh, and Helica's point about how kids learn differently and we're able to engage in ways that they wouldn't if they had to actually show up in person is not, is something we shouldn't forget. Um, I'd also say that the flexibility has to come uh, continuing with our federal funding. Um, Richard mentioned Title IIA, and, and we've done a lot of work on that at CCSSO about how you blend and braid funding to get to your end goals. Um, and that's something that we believe strongly in. And so it's not just the pandemic money um, that we need or the, the supplemental stuff that comes in, but it's it's rethinking the way in which we go about federal funding and the way the streams come in and how we utilize that to get to end some end goals. Yeah, the equity um, consideration is so important. And we know CCSO has been doing a lot to support states in keeping an equity lens um, on this crisis and, and all of the work. Um, and Helica, I know in Rhode Island, you'll have done some work with XQ on looking at equity um, as it relates to, to the COVID response, but, but college and career pathways generally. Would you want to think about or talk a little bit about how that's worked and Oh, yeah, so we've been working really closely with XQ and even BAR and, and really reimagining what high schools can look like. And I think that that for us has been really important, especially when we start talking about the population that we serve, especially in our urban sectors. I think that um, one of the things that we have been really adamant about is really working with the community and having the community voice be part of that. And, and how does the... Um, how do we talk about having leading from an area of strength digitally when you have a community that this is the first time they've had access to, to this kind of technology? And, and how do we reinvent that for the community? 
And I think that for us has been very powerful as we're looking at how we move forward as a state. And one of the things that we did is that we created a separate position to look at this statewide, not just with the XQ schools, but statewide, how do we think out of the box? What does it mean to really graduate with a Rhode Island diploma and how are we being innovative and, and really pushing the agenda? I think that for a long time, um, like I said earlier, we've been looking at this whole eight to three and, um, and then the, the equity issue. So we have a child, and this is all I'll say about that, that you know needs to work. Right. So when he has construction jobs, he works and he comes to school and at eight o'clock in the morning, he's asleep in the school. And um, why do we have to do that? Right. Why? Why couldn't we have some flexibility around the needs of the actual community? We keep wanting communities to conform to our rigid standards of what we think schooling is. We're in 2020. Right? That's not reality. Right. It's just not. So I think for us, it's reinventing what high school should be across the entire state. And we've been doing a lot of that work and really looking at how the kids can be in college, getting college credit, like, it, you, you know, our networks of really blurring those lines and really making it meaningful for kids. And also, what is CTE? We want all our kids to have CTE exposure, right, and work around it. It's not one or the other, but both. So I know that I talked more than I should have here, but this is an exciting time for us. And when we start looking at equity, we just can't have one way of doing things. And that's where we're pushing ourselves really hard. And I have to tell you that our educators have cried because they have realized how much we've shortchanged kids by doing things the same way. And those people that are involved in these sessions have really um, changed the way that they think about high school. Um, Penny, we'd love to hear a little bit about um, rural considerations as it relates to equity and, and the response to the pandemic. Obviously, Tennessee has a, a lot of rural areas. How is that? that yeah, so, so appreciate that question. I, I think that oftentimes, you know, and certainly this is nationally, when we think about equity, there are so many different lenses that we can have. And, and in Tennessee, um, you know, Governor Lee and our, our the administration has been really focused on our rural communities. The vast majority of our counties are rural. And what we've seen in the pandemic is that it's not just about technology, although that has been one of the greatest inequities that we've seen, as I've said, about just access, um, certainly some funding allocations, and, and then certainly for, for Wi-Fi and connectivity, um, cell phone coverage. Teachers can't teach from home if, if, um, they, can't get, if they can't get Wi-Fi at their home. Our governor doesn't have Wi-Fi at his farm. So um, one of the things that we are also thinking about is just the other wraparound supports that we saw that were available um, in our urban and suburban communities that weren't available in our rural communities. So you think about nutrition programs. Um, you can't, there aren't um, a ton of partners that are all consolidated in one place who can help with meal distribution for students or delivering work packets. Um, we have issues related to natural events, mudslides that block off roads. Those are the kind of real life things where families can't leave their homes and they have to drive 15 or 20 minutes to a grocery store um, or to be able to pick up a work packet. That is a real consideration for a number of our families, especially as we're moving into cold weather months. And so we've been doing some work in a couple of areas. One is around access. We talk to our superintendents twice a week as a group um, of the whole state. We also do one-on-ones and then small regional groups to be able to understand the specific needs of the various regions across the state. Um, as we're thinking about grant opportunities, another shift that we made um, was to say that when, when you kind of have a one-size-fits-all grant opportunity, those big districts that have grant writers on staff naturally have an advantage that our small and rural districts do not. So we've been doing equity in terms of access um, we have a diverse educators network to make sure that we increase the number of educators of color, that we increase the number of educators who are from communities. We've got the largest Grow Your Own uh, program in the country right now with a third of our district, just about a third of our districts um, and uh, over six uh, higher education programs so that our rural communities who were facing some challenges are able to literally grow their own teachers in partnership so those teachers go to become a teacher for free and get paid to do so. We're doing all of that so that our small and rural districts have the same opportunities now and in the future. And I think that one of the things that we're most proud of, EdTrust came out with 
um, their kind of their summary of um, of work in this space and specifically around diversity and equity. Um, and Tennessee was one of the top two ranked states in in the country um, after just 18 months of really diligent work in here um, and in this space and in a, in frankly in a state in the deep south. Um, it is possible and it is really important. That is not just in our urban communities. That is work that has been meaningfully done in our rural communities. Um, and it's been really hard work for our superintendents. And I want to give them a lot of credit. But honestly, I think it is about access to resources when they don't have them in the community and access to grant opportunities when they do not have the staffing. And your superintendent is the bus driver, the substitute, and the cafeteria worker. And that is a very real thing for a number of our districts. They're not going to write some 25 page grant application, even if they know they can execute it and they want to do it because they just don't have the manpower. We are providing that as a state, and I think this pandemic has elevated our responsibility for that and expanded a lot of opportunities that I would say a third of our districts never would have been able to have. But that is not just the state, that is the state and the districts working in very close partnership. We've become, we talk about just our family table conversations. It's like family dinner. We're gonna have it out and we're gonna have it out behind closed doors. Um, but it's nice to get to that space with superintendents. I've got 147 very, very different ones. Um, and I think coming together, especially with those who um, have been looking for, maybe not received that support in the past has been, I think, really powerful for us in moving forward. That's great. Um, and congratulations on, on the impressive work. Uh, it takes real leadership. Um, on, our, on our last question here, I think just building off of that in partnerships between um, district leaders, nonprofits, philanthropists, um, would love to just kind of go around and maybe Carissa, starting with you, um, you know, for our audience, which is a lot of district leaders and uh, state leaders, how would you recommend approaching partnerships? Um, and uh, what would your advice be to, to moving the work ahead into 2021? <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I would say partnership is as critical as it has ever been. Um, we started uh, two years ago, Pedro Rivera was our uh, board chair, uh, Pennsylvania chief, uh, and he started out uh, bringing in his colleagues from uh, corrections and health and human services and, and a, a bunch of others. And, and we talked a lot about how do we build these partnerships? And, and then we entered this year and it became absolutely utterly clear how critical the partnerships across government are, across our communities are, across the, the funding world, that like we're inextricably intertwined. And so it's forced some of those conversations that, you know, Penny talked about the dinner conversations. So it's forced some of those conversations where we have to like put those things together. Um, I, I would just say that if I'm thinking about on the horizon, the things that are most important, um, in this economies of scale, which I have been beating on the on throughout this, uh, is that our high quality instructional materials, the focus on literacy, um, and how we make sure we're assessing students in some meaningful way, wrapped into how we deliver in a digital environment, are critical. Like it, we've got to have the best of the best materials and resources out there, so that everyone, everyone has access to those things, and our partners have to help us get there. And Halika, anything from your end in terms of advice for approaching partnerships? Well, um, just to piggyback on Carissa, there is, there is no way to do this without partnerships. There just is none. And I think one of the things that we have been able to do um, because of the pandemic is create these partnerships. So in our meetings with superintendents, it's, we have also invited obviously charter school leaders, but also um, private schools, parochial schools, independent schools. So we, once again, it's, we're taking the statewide approach. And the reason that that's important is we share buses, right? We go from, you know, we share statewide buses, we share teachers, expertise. Um, we put politics aside and really have centered in on the students, the educators, we're all in this together. And then the other piece is that we've been glued to the hip with the Department of Health, which is not something that um, state agencies, um, you know, we do very well in the past or we have done very well in the past. But now it's, it's we have this rhythm. And at first we we're calling it a battle, a battle rhythm, like, all right, we're going to go there together. And then it becomes exhausting, right? And then we, we start having different conversations and then other things come into play. But it's also getting back into that place where 
we are all focused on the kids getting the instruction that they need, the teachers getting the support that they need, and really putting everything else aside, um, which is difficult in a, in a bureaucracy to do. But we have managed to do that well, that I don't think we'll ever go back to not working in this way moving forward, because we are working with DHS, you know, um, the Department of Health, that it just everybody. Um, to really make it successful. Because as we start thinking about this, we still have homeless kids. We still have kids that, that need our support. It's, it's about, it's everything. It's the whole ecosystem really working together to make sure, at, at, you know, at least in our state, that schools stay open, that kids get the instruction, that everybody's healthy. Um, we've all heard that the schools are not the big super spreaders, that everybody was afraid they would be. And making sure that that data is very public and that we're working in concert with one another. And um, that's not easy, but it's the only way that we're gonna be successful. And um, I look forward to continuing to work together. And I have to say this, Carissa, I wanna thank you because you've put all our states together and we have um, survived and thrived because of those partnerships. Thank you. Penny, last words. Um, any last advice before you wrap up? I, I would just echo everything that they said around partnerships, both state agencies, partners on the ground. And I will add, um, you know, it, it's no secret for those who are out there or on the state or on the district side, oftentimes that is not a partnership as much as it is a, a very um, interesting relationship and dynamic. And so I will say that the thing that I'm taking away, I'm in schools um, every single week. Um, I think been in, gosh, 50 districts. Um, since the start of the school year, it's it's really important to me if people are on the ground, so am I. And I think the thing that I have come to value the most is the strength of the honesty and candor in a way that is about partnership and outcomes. And that is something that we we will never, ever let go of um, and something I think really great lessons learned for myself, but also I think for the team here at the department. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for our superintendents, our educators, our principals, uh, the nutrition folks, the transportation drivers, all the people on the ground. Um, we talk about schools as kind of these monolithic beings or districts in, in that way, but they are filled with people who are doing incredibly important work for our kids so that our communities, our economy, and everything else is, is set up for the future and our kids have the same chance as anybody else. And so I just want to make sure to say a special thank you to, to those folks and that the partnerships with them um, is what makes this work. We are here to support that work. So it, and um, just a lot of respect for these two women as well. They are pretty phenomenal and very, very lucky to work with them every day. Well, thank you to all of you for your leadership and all that you're doing right now.